accompanying our course, Launching New Ventures, which is a free online course on entrepreneurship strategy and strategy for tech-driven startups that's available on Coursera. We're now in the fourth week of our course, so we have one more week left, and we're really glad to welcome some awesome panelists with us today to talk about the pract their practical experiences with raising and managing money. So I'm very glad to welcome Rachel Cook, an entrepreneur who's joining us. Flynn. Hey, Rachel. Hey. <laughs> so Rachel is the founder of Seeds, which converts freemium gamers into paying players through in-game microloan purchases. She has a really interesting background, uh, formerly working in finance and in documentary filmmaking. And her filmmaking team included Emmy and Grammy nominees. So we have a lot of rich experiences to be uh, listening to from Rachel coming soon. And then we also have William McQuillan, who's joining us from London, right, Will? Yeah, in London. Hey, Natra, how are you? Thanks so much for joining us, Will. Will is a partner at Frontline Ventures. He was a co-founder and CEO of Osmoda.com, an online sales platform targeting some of Europe's top emerging fashion brands before switching into the other side of the table, <laughs> as we call it. And last but not least, we have uh, Jonathan Razfriedman, who is joining us from Shenzhen. Jonathan is the founder and CEO of Kano. Hey, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. What time is it over, over there? It looks dark. It's 10.30 uh, p.m. Shenzhen time. Wow, great. So this is really an international panel. <clears throat> I wonder if we have any viewers watching this from, uh, while wearing their pajamas. So Jonathan is the founder and CEO of Kano, a computer that anyone can build. Kano raised over $1.5 million through its Kickstarter campaign last year, passing their goal of $100,000. They recently announced a Series A funding of $15 million this year including $500,000 that are open to community backers on an equity crowdfunding platform called Choir. So we have really a vast range of experiences to talk about here today, all of the many different ways of uh, raising money for your startup and for your idea. So what's going to happen in the next hour is we're going to field some questions to our expert panelists. They're going to answer them and these questions have been submitted to uh, me via our Coursera platform um, and via our Facebook uh, group and our Twitter feeds. So if you're listening right now, feel free to use the hashtag LNV15. So that's short for launching new ventures and we'll be sure to include them later on in the hour if we have time. So. I'm going to start off with a general question. We're talking about raising and managing money for your venture. Um, so my question here is um, something that I heard a lot while traveling to interview entrepreneurs for our course. We're, we featured entrepreneurs from sub-Saharan Africa and around Europe. And something that they say is, I don't have enough money to be an entrepreneur. So I was wondering, when uh, is this true in your eyes? How did you guys get started? I wonder who wants to take this. Rachel, would you like to start on how you get got started? Was this a question, is this a statement that you had in your mind? I don't have sure. enough money to be an entrepreneur? Um, in my case, I just kind of dove in, and I would highly advise taking that route. If you have an idea and you think it can work, um, you're going to you're going to just need to take the leap at some point, and there are going to be a million hurdles that get in your way, and lack of funding is one of those. So um, for me, it was kind of like making the decision to launch the company, um, which didn't feel very, it wasn't like a huge leap at the beginning. It was just like I had this idea that I thought would work, and I was excited about it, but I needed to survive at the same time. So um, it's funny, I think, how once you kind of set something in motion that opportunities present themselves to help you succeed that you might not have been able to foresee. So I actually came across a blog post, I, rem I remember, um, a Mark Schuster's blog, Both Sides of the Table. Um, so if, for those of you who aren't familiar with Mark Schuster, he was, I think, a, a two-time entrepreneur, and then he later became a VC. And he has this blog, and I still read it regularly. 
but uh, I think this was in like maybe April of 2012, something like that. He posted about another founder that he knew, uh, this woman Tracy, I think her last name was Denunzio, and she had actually bootstrapped her startup um, using Airbnb. So she would sleep on the couch in her apartment and Airbnb out her room, and I think she brought in like $28,000 in a year, and that allowed her to survive while working on her startup full time. So I just came across this piece of information and thought like, hey, I could do this with my apartment in New York as well. And um, that was one way that I kind of found enough funding to, to be able to focus on the startup full time while making sure that I could pay my rent and, and buy food and so forth. Um, so yeah, there, there's always going to be a way to find what you need if you just kind of start keeping an eye out for, for more information and, and asking around about resources that, that might be available. Thanks, Rachel. So let's um, give our viewers a bit more of a background. You've been working on your startup for how many years? <laughs> Um, so we didn't officially incorporate until February of 2013, but the idea existed in some form since I believe like, I think it was like the middle of 2011, so it's, it's been something like four years. We've pivoted a couple times, and there were years of, of just trying to survive at the beginning. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's coming together, and, and the kind of what I... It's just funny how much you learn when you launch a startup. Some of the things that I, I understand now would have seemed completely inaccessible to me a couple years ago. So um, again, I think this is, supports the idea that just taking the leap and diving in is it's really, I think it's requisite. Um, don't, don't feel as though you need to over-prepare. Just kind of do it, and you'll have to learn things as you're going. And um, that's kind so of that's the best way to do it, I think, sometimes. That's super inspiring. So I, I just want to make sure people are following. Um, I know that you've been working in finance for some time and you also dabbled in some creative projects. So you did have some money saved before you found this opportunity to match microfinance organizations with uh, gaming platforms. So what your startup enables people who create online or computer games uh, to do is to allow them to make purchases that are then directly transformed into microfinance loans in the developing world. And um, so it sounds like you had this great idea, you had some money saved and you went into it, you just threw yourself into it and now you've, you're, you're working on bootstrapping your way um, to, as, your, as your venture starts to build traction. Uh, I, so I didn't have any money saved by the time I launched Seeds because I, I'd sunk the savings that I did have into my previous documentary project. Um, and, but I did bootstrap for a while and then as I was going along and we started to gain more traction, I was able to raise a seed round um, of around $600,000. But it was, it was because I kind of set things in motion that fundraising became uh, more doable along the line. Thanks, Rachel. Let's switch over to Jonathan. So, Jonathan, can you explain to me the concept behind Kano, when you got it, and how you got started? Yeah, well, there's the long story and the short story. I think I'll take the, uh, I'll take the short story just for the sake of, of our global <laughs> listeners. Um, and, you know, the short story is basically three people, you know, myself and my two co-founders, coming together around a concept of making technology accessible as a form of creation to anyone in the world, regardless of age, location, um, and knowledge. And, you know, we basically started with that notion, and then we gave a, a piece of hardware to a six-year-old who happened to be the son of one of my co-founders. And, you know, he told us that he would love to build his own computer, but he wanted to do it uh, with no one teaches him how to do it. So it needs to be simple and fun, like Lego. Um, you know, and with that kind of a challenge, we went forward and developed a, a kind of a prototype, an alpha version, um, you know, outside, uh, out of an apartment in London. And after four months, we launched a prototype, you know, and we kind of launched it on a website, 200 units that we've basically made ourselves um, in a flat. You know, one of the corners of the living room was a warehouse where we stored the components. Another corner of the living room were the place where we had a dispatch uh, printer for shipping the product with Royal Mail, um, you know, and we were assembling ourselves the kit and basically timing how long it would take us to assemble the kit, which was pretty fun. Uh, it took us way too long, of course, and we've made some improvements since then. Um, and then following that initial success, we started to do, following that initial process, we started to do um, uh, workshops where we kind of really gouged the interest for, from kids and young people around what we're building. 
And the first workshop we've done, we've done, basically the first interaction we had with our prototype, we ran a workshop with 20 kids at the age of nine in a primary school in London. And at the end of the workshop, one of the kids named Khalid, a nine-year-old, stood up and said that adults treat them like they're incapable because they're young, but today they've made a computer, so they're like super children. Um, and you know, for us, that was a huge kind of vote of confidence, which you know led us to raise a bit of money, move into an office, hire our first employee, um, and then for the next few months, we kind of prepared to our, um, as you mentioned, our successful Kickstarter campaigns. But but that was basically the first six to nine months of of the company's life. You know, with me relocating my life from Tel Aviv to London with uh, my other co-founder, Alex, finishing his master's degree in, in Cambridge, and the other co-founder, Saul, basically you know, doing his own job of a day-to-day -day VC uh, and a family person. Um, and you know, in between all that, we've managed to, to get to where we were after six months. That's really interesting. So I really love the idea of you making these things in your apartment. And I also think what's interesting in your case, um, Jonathan, you had a lot of industry experience before deciding to be an entrepreneur, so it seems like um, we have two examples here of entrepreneurs who actually did different things before deciding they wanted to launch this adventure rather than um, uh, one of the myths today, or not myths, but most popular stories of um, individuals who drop out of school. It seems like um, this was something that you both thought about and were deeply committed to. Well, there's the misconceptions of a uh, majority of entrepreneurs drop from high school or university. Uh, there are a few, definitely. The most renowned ones, and we know who they are. Uh, I, you know, my recommendation from my personal experience, and I cannot speak for anyone else. You know, what worked really well for me was, you know, I graduated from an entrepreneurship program in university, where during my university year, my last year, I basically worked on a first venture which was called FunKit. And we developed kind of custom stickers to sneakers that kids can design themselves, and we would mass manufacture. And once we finished that year, I realized two things. One, I don't want to sell stickers, which was the obvious thing. The other one was, which I have no idea how to run a business. And I needed to learn, and the answer for me was not necessarily an MBA. I wanted to learn from someone, so I joined uh, a multinational global you know, manufacturing company where I had the, really the privilege and luck to work with the, the president of the company for three years and really learn a lot about you know, mass manufacturing, industrial design, and commercializing new products. Um, and while I've been there, I knew eventually I'm going to start another company or try to start a successful company. So it was clear to me, but I was obviously waiting for the right opportunity, the right people, um, and, and you know, the right kind of the right timing. And, and it's, never, it's never in front of you bluntly. You just need to sometimes just take the plunge, you know, just like Ronald Coyne says in his book, um, you know, uh, Second Bounce of the Ball, you know, you can't learn to swim by exercising at the beach. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> it reminds me of these uh, wonderful old-fashioned uh, photographs of uh, women who were tied around the waist with a rope and taught how to swim. Um, I guess that was the old way of doing things, and now we're just oh. jumping straight into the water. Um, yeah. And I would echo that across our portfolio. You know, on, on the first point, you know, we uh, do you have enough money to start a company? It's usually people who have been at some point in their life. Maybe they're in college, but mostly they're people who've worked for a number of years and they've seen a problem that they think that they can solve and that they think should be solved, and they're passionate enough about it so that they're willing to, to actually take the risk, both financially and personally, to go and start their own company. And so it's rarely about uh, do they have enough money to start. It's more about you know are they passionate and driven enough about what they want to do because it's always going to be difficult. Even if you have a bit of money at the beginning, saved or not, it's you know being an entrepreneur. And I'm sure both the guys will back, back me up on this statement: is you're constantly putting out fires, you're constantly problem solving, and there's always challenges. It's ups and downs on a daily basis, and you know you need to be really passionate about the idea. So you know we see that across the founders in our portfolio. You know they are people who have you know sometimes uh, quit jobs and taken huge financial risk. I, mean, I know one of our companies, um, you know, for I think the first year and a half, they were in their parents' house using one of the rooms until they got to almost ten people, and then I think their parents were like, "You need to move this office somewhere else." Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it, it's it's you, there are ways around the money. The but it's more about you finding something that you're really passionate about and that you're really willing to work hard uh, and love doing. Thanks, Will. I think that gives us really important perspective. Um, 
so waiting for this right moment, waiting to find that opportunity, and at the same time continually investing in yourself, whether it is uh, gaining new experiences or taking courses, um, but uh, really just waiting for this opportunity that you'll be passionate about. I also wanted to uh, bring something up because I think we have uh, 40% of, of, of our students in this course are from emerging markets and maybe that can be a little bit different. Maybe people will look from emerging markets to developed economies and say, well, you know, they clearly have uh, enough money to, to launch a startup. So um, from, from what I've seen, it appears that uh, entrepreneurs everywhere face the same the same challenges, even though some may be more extreme than others. And you really just need to have enough money to get started. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot. I mean, everyone has social networks or families, parents, uh, hopefully, where they can uh, work in from their, that, that, where they can find a room to work out of. So um, that was a really important perspective. Will, do you want to give us an overview of the target funding amounts that uh, Frontline um, uh, envisions. Uh, I want to help the viewers situate our entrepreneurs where on where they might be in their funding journey from seed funding to maybe Series A funding or beyond. So just to make sure I understood the question, you're asking uh, uh, how much do people raise at different points or what they need to have to, sh to raise a certain amount? Which were you? Um, I'm asking um, what are the target amounts that an entrepreneur might choose to raise from the beginning of their entrepreneur real journey to the end and where Frontline uh, likes to position themselves. Sure. So we, we're an early stage investor. That What that basically means is we'll do, uh, we can invest as little as 100,000, as much as 2 million <clears throat> and really we invest at the earliest stages of a company. We're usually one of the first investors, if not the first investor in a company. What that often means is that it could be an idea on a piece of paper. They often usually don't even have their product built yet. It's just a prototype. Um, and so we, we tend to invest very, very early. Uh, but this, so that's where we invest. I guess for your listeners, you know, trying to understand how much you should raise at the beginning is really uh, a question for each individual person to ask themselves. I think really what they need to do is, first of all, they need to decide, you know, what will this money, where will this money bring me to? You know, if, <clears throat> if it brings them to profitability, that's fantastic. If it brings them, uh, then they won't ever need to think about raising again, and that's the amount they should raise. But usually, for a company to get to profitability, it needs to raise quite a lot of money. And so they raise it in, in, in series or different chunks. So that could be a seed round, a series A round. So then if you take kind of the first round of funding, if you're thinking about how much you should raise, really what you should think about is what is the milestone it's going to get me to to allow me to raise that next round to eventually hopefully get to that profitability point. And so that could be a milestone. So you know that might be, you know in, in Jonathan's case, a successful Kickstarter campaign, or it could be assembling a great team, or it could be having a prototype, or it could be getting to a certain amount of revenue. Um, and it really differs per person. Uh, but I think the key thing that uh, the people listening need to do is consider two things. First of all, you know, what milestone is this raise going to get me to? And secondly, you know, they want to raise at least an amount that will last them 12 months. And the reason why I say that is because it really does take quite a bit of time to raise money. And I'm sure both Jonathan and Rachel will, will back that up, is that it always takes longer than you think. It's always, you know, there's a lot of back and forth, and it takes a huge amount of time from the company. So it's not something you want to be doing that often. So the first thing is I'd say raise enough to get to a good milestone. And the second thing is I'd say, you know, you want to get a minimum uh, capital amount that'll last you 12 months. And however much that amount is, it differs per company depending on what they need to do. But that, that would be my advice to the listeners. Thanks, well that's really helpful. Um, Rachel, do you want to comment on that, how, if that's been true for you? What kind of time horizon uh, did you look at when you were raising your seed funding? <laughs> Um, I mean, in my case, which may be somewhat unusual, I, I didn't feel that I had the luxury when I was just kind of trying to hustle and get by to, um, or I, I, I at least wasn't successfully able to raise enough to get us 12 months of runway, although that would have been great. Um, so it was more of sort of a bootstrap me mentality, as we've already talked about. Um, so we, we started generating revenue and focusing on generating revenue earlier and were able to bring in a little bit and that helped us get by. Um, and then there are other things that I did as well in that um, I, so my, in my past life, as, as touched on, I was in finance, I was a futures and equities trader and I actually, um, I was paying attention to Bitcoin in like the middle of 2013 and I saw that the prices had dipped uh, low after Silk Road was shut down and that the U.S. federal government had seized a large amount of Bitcoin. And um, so the stock trader in me kind of just 
process that information and saw an opportunity to maybe make some money on a Bitcoin trade. And I ended up putting on uh, as much, putting in as much as I could afford at the time and buying as much Bitcoin as I could afford. And I wrote out that trade and was able to make about eight times my money in like a three month period. So I, I just share that. And then I, I used that money to pay my employees and continue bootstrapping the company. Um, so I, work. <laughs> thanks. I mean, it ended up being a really a great trade and I, I timed it pretty well. Um, but I, I mean, the opportunities like that are, are that was sort of a, a unique opportunity. But um, I just bring this up because it kind of it dovetailed with a skill set that I already had. I knew how to, to make money um, trading different types of, of products, right? So I saw this opportunity and I made some money on it and that helped me to survive. So um, yeah, I mean, because it didn't seem like I was going to be able to um, attract a VC, at least in that stage of the company's life, I was kind of looking for other ways to, to make sure that we could keep the company going. That's super inspiring and actually much more glamorous than the stories I've heard of Airbnb founders selling cereal. Um, <laughs> so they were also, the opportunity they spotted was, it was during the president, presidential campaigns, and so they created a cereal called Obama O's, which um, then sold out. So D don't that's forget a really... the, McCain, the McCain Crunch ones as well. Oh yes, and those as well, of course, with amazing illustrations. Yeah. Um, so. This is just yet another story that I find really inspiring. Um, Jonathan, do you do you want to talk about where you're at in your in your funding journey? So you started out um, raising some seed funding, and then you had enormous success with your Kickstarter campaign, and recently just announced a new Series A funding round. And so some of the people who have backed you um, are VCs such as Index Ventures, Collaborative Fund, and Jim, Jim Breyer from Breyer Capital. Um, where do you see, how, how long do you imagine this, this money then lasting and where do you look, how do you project your, your fundraising efforts in the future? Yeah, well, it's obviously a, a challenging question to ask. Um, you know, we, we, we were definitely lucky from the beginning to have several great angels, investors supporting the company before the days of, before the Kickstarter, um, which, you know, obviously supported us in uh, in, in creating a, a successful Kickstarter campaign, and then we had a, and then we had the seed round, basically about slightly more than a year ago, um, and you know just recently, as you mentioned, we we've uh, completed our Series A financing of 15 million dollars, um, led by Jim Breyer. So, you know, so we have you know we have private investors, we have institutional investor, and we have you know, let's say um, kind of leading uh, global leading. Startup investors like Jim Breyer that have supporting that have supported us among among other people, um, and you know from here obviously with such a, a substantial financing for for our stage of the business we all, we obviously hope to to get to a place where we don't need any more equity money. Uh, it doesn't mean we're not going to be interested in raising more money, um, but you know our hopes and plans are to you know build a, a sustainable. Um, cash flow positive business from the financing we've got so far. Uh, there are other forms of financing as well, which you know we've we've done in the past and will probably continue in the future. Like, you know, we have support from Barclays, one of the main high street banks in the UK, which supports us with working capital to build inventory. Um, and that's obviously one of the areas that you know startups like ours, hardware startups, um, which by the way you didn't mention, so I'm just happy to to mention it myself. We yesterday we won the best hardware startup in Europe in the Europa, so it's it's a pretty exciting. Congratulations! Congratulations. Wow! Congratulations. Congratulations! Thank you, thank you. Luckily, I was. You, it's hard to keep up with it. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're trying to enjoy really every small win we have as a company, and not just kind of these big trophies. But it's obviously nice. But you know, going back to the point, um, you know, financing is a job, and you know, we'll mention it correctly. You know, out of the two and a half years that we are alive as a company, you know, I personally spent over you know, probably at the minimum over six months, if not more, of literally focusing only on financing efforts, meeting travels, uh, and you know, the Series A financing was really kind of the peak of, of of our financing efforts to date because of the substantial amount. And you know, I've been traveling like crazy. So the, let's say the first four or five months of this year, I've I spent most of my time on that. So it takes a lot of time. It's a job. It's not something you do part time, and that's why I totally, you know, plus one on Will's comment on raise as much as you as you as you. First of all, raise as much as you think you need, but obviously raise as much as you can. 
So if you if you think you need ten million, but someone ta comes and tells you, or if you think you need one million, but someone comes and tells you take two, you know they t then take the two. Especially at the early stages, you don't want to find yourself you know raising money and it's actually less than you thought you need for a runway of eighteen months, because otherwise you're going to raise money and not for a year, and after six months you'll find yourself also again raising money. And as you know, as I just mentioned clearly, it's going to take a lot of your time and resources. And you know, financing at the end of the day, it's critical for the survival of the business. And one of the roles of the founders and the CEOs is to make sure the company have enough blood, and it means money in the bank. Uh, having said that, at the end of the day, there's a business to build, there's a team to grow, and if there's one thing that is probably way more challenging and difficult than starting a company is actually to run a company, and that means hiring people, growing the people. It becomes all about the people once you actually launch something. Um, and this is where you need to spend your time as a founder. So I think also people need to think, you know, the audience in my view need to think not just only about what's an exciting idea and am I passionate about it. To me that's like the given, the obvious thing to do, which if you don't have that, don't even consider starting something. But then once it's clear to you, like totally flip your the coin and really see the bigger picture which is you're going to spend a lot of time in, uh, selling to investors to invest in your company unless you have brilliant mind uh, like Rachel to manage to do mm -hmm. some some you know some quick wins on, on on Bitcoin which I think is actually brilliant so well done uh, and most importantly you're going to spend a ton of your time talking to people recruiting people selling your vision to people who you want to join you and then once they join this is where it actually really starts. You have to manage them, you have to motivate, you have to give them clarity, you have to make them happy, you have to inspire them because they're going to need to do that as well when they hire people. And this is probably one of the hardest, if not the hardest things I've, I've done so far in my life and it will continue to be so now that we are kind of crossing the 40 people team which is a big, big challenge. Yeah, that's the really great clarification point, Jonathan. So it seems that in as we're really happy to be supporting entrepreneurship here at EPFL and to be promoting um, the idea that we have what it takes, all of us, we can learn what it takes to start a company um, and we want to promote people to not be scared and take that leap but at the same time while promoting entrepreneurship um, there is a danger in promoting uh, what Max Marmer wrote in HBR called celebrity entrepreneurship or mistaking winning um, pitching competitions for example as success or uh, equating f uh, fundraising as success as you mentioned it's just the first part of the um, of the challenge and actually a lot of startups um, few but a lot of startups manage to make it just through bootstrapping and organic growth and don't actually need outside fundraising so this brings me to one of the questions I'd like to start bringing in some questions now from the students this is from Nadua who sent in her question from Abhijan um, so the question is when are you re ready to raise money is there a checklist so will you mentioned that uh, some the in your portfolio sometimes they only had a prototype um, and Jonathan you also mentioned that you were building these prototypes uh, and then you were funded I'm not sure about the exact order but you had angel investment then seed investment and you were building the uh, prototypes in the meanwhile Rachel do you want to start when did you um, think you were sure. ready to raise money and what kind of advice do you want to give students? Sure. Um, well, again, I was intense on survival, so, so that was what kind of dictated my timing. But I actually got a really great piece of advice from Jeff Siebert, who was a co-founder of Crashlytics, which was uh, acquired by Twitter in 2012. And um, he spoke at an accelerator that we went through last year, and he said that um, he would classify investors in two ways. There are vision-driven investors and then momentum-driven investors. Um, angel investors and sort of smaller smaller size checks, um, that would typically fall under the, uh, the vision umbrella. And he said that he thought that a lot of startups make the mistake of thinking that they should raise when they launch a prototype. And he actually uh, advised either raising before the launch of the prototype. So um, the thinking there was that you could launch a prototype and something inevitably is going to go wrong, something's not going to work, and you're going to be scrambling to kind of fix that. And when you do that, you're not pitching a vision anymore because there's, there's actually this, like, this technology that exists in reality. Um, and you can pitch a vision and make it sound sort of like much more grand um, in the beginning. 
And then you can only raise from momentum investors once once the prototype is is working and you have like a clear product uh, market fit and you're growing. So um, anyway, what I'm trying to say is that like what worked for me was pitching vision investors. So when we had some traction, I, I would share that, but I would really try to get investors incite, excited about kind of like the the mission behind what we're doing. We're interested in transforming the definition of gaming so that it incorporates social good. And because that was the mission, I was able to find vision-focused investors, angel investors, who just were really into that idea. And the other great thing about angel investors is that they write checks quickly. They tend to write checks quickly. So um, I could go in and just get someone excited about what we were trying to do, and they would write a check. Um, this, you know, like, this happens, you know, I don't know, one out of every 40 meetings or something is probably what my track record was. But, um... Yeah, so I think kind of like the conventional wisdom that trying to raise when you have a prototype might not necessarily be the best way to go um, for every startup. So let me rephrase that. I think in, within this question, when are you ready to raise money, there's also the big question of uh, who can you raise money from. So it sounds like with angel investors, especially if you have contact to angel investors, it's not easy, as you said. One out of 40 uh, investors you talk to will say yes. <laughs> I think that's important to say. I mean, that sounds like actually a really optimistic number to me. Um, I think it's important <laughs> to say, like, don't be discouraged and keep going and keep yes. going. Uh, keep pitching because um, it's it does sound that you have like you have a great vision so you were saying that your startup helps to incorporate social good into a, a game so you might have any type of online game that's very popular um, but doesn't have any um, social as explicitly social component to it mm -hmm. and so what you can what you do is you create this plugin that allows <clears throat> gamers to buy something that then translates into some action in real life. It, it could also be something like planting a tree or something. Uh, maybe you build a, you plant a tree in, in the game and then it also equates to planting a tree in real life. But in your case, you're providing microfinance loans exactly. in developing countries. Right. Um, and I would just quickly uh, add, uh, because I think this might be helpful for those uh, people listening who are in emerging markets as well, um, Angelist, A-N-G-E-L dot C-O, has been a, a fantastic resource for us and it allows you to access investors all around the world. Um, I've been able to close uh, somewhere between uh, probably around $150,000 from investors through Angelist that I've never actually met in person. And I'd be happy to talk more about the technique I used in order to close those investors. I could do that offline if anyone wants to reach out to me directly. But um, that's that's a way that you can plug into investors and other startup hubs, even if you're in a geographical location where there isn't kind of like a, a strong um, startup ecosystem or a, a mature startup startup ecosystem just yet. Thanks for that tip, Rachel. It's true that in a lot of places, including Europe, the angel investment space is not very well developed, and that resource to AngelList will be very helpful. And it actually leads into my next question. So. Um, Will, could you tell us how does someone typically get in touch with you or how do you hear about um, a startup? And then could you also comment on um, when were cases when you knew that the startup should not be pitching you right now, that the startup <laughs> was not ready? Uh, so <clears throat> on the first one I can answer pretty well, I think. We, we track where all of the, every deal that we see as a, as a fund, we track exactly uh, not just the details of the deal, but also where we where it came from and how we found it. And so we see roughly about a thousand companies a year. Of those thousand companies, you know, uh, you know, we invest in about ten a year. So first of all, you know, it's it's a pretty pretty steep funnel for how many we see to how many we invest in. Um, but of the ten that we invested in, uh, roughly or usually about eighty percent of those come through personal contacts. So uh, and yet at the same time, of the thousand about 40% of those come through cold calls. So what I'm basically saying is that we've never invested in a company that cold called us on LinkedIn or on Twitter or via email, but in reality, uh, we, we invest in people who come through personal contacts. And the reason why is the best, I mean, it, there's no question, the best way to get in touch with an investor is to go through someone he respects. Whether that's you, um, you choosing uh, um, someone in our portfolio, someone we've invested in, and saying like, look, you know, here's my tech, have a look at it. They look at it, and then they call me and say, look, you know, you need to meet these other founders. It might be another investor. It could be someone who's an expert in a field. But the thing is, is that the, the best way to get an investor to meet with you, and the best chance you have of getting them to listen to you, is to go through a personal contact. 
Um, and that, that's my view on it. You know, it's definitely the way the numbers in our portfolio show it. Um, and then on your second question, remind me your second question again, Matrix, excuse me. It was a question on, maybe I could phrase it in a more positive way. Could you provide maybe a, a few checklist oh. items that a startup can, can use to see yeah. if they're ready to raise VC funding? Yeah. Uh, so I think, I think um, when you're raising money from a, a venture capital fund, you've got to realize you're taking on institutional capital. And with that, there are certain kind of financial things that need to be in order. So you, know, you need to have your accounts in order. You need to have accounts that actually you can show and, uh, and produce. You know, most funds wouldn't be allowed to invest in a company that doesn't have regular accounts coming out. They have a fiduciary duty to their investors to make sure that that's happening. I think also, uh, you know, but, but apart from that, actually, in, in reality, you know, the, the stage we invest in entrepreneurs, it's more about different funds act very differently. You know, some funds invest very late stage and write big checks, but there's quite a number of funds like us uh, that really are, are, are able to invest very early on. So again, as I mentioned earlier, for us, you know, we've invested in a team of two or three people who've just started the company with an idea and a vision. Um, I think maybe the only thing that we wouldn't invest in is we don't invest in single founder companies. Um, we, we, we think there's a, a huge power in kind of in, in having a team but with the exception of that I think for us you know once once they once they are a strong team um, and they have an, uh, they're going after a market that we think is interesting you know we're pretty happy to invest and the the, the point on accounts can be solved pretty quickly with an account accountant yeah, and that's an also a really interesting point about teammates and building either a strong co-founder group or team team group because you would it seems like one of the messages you're putting across is that you want to see entrepreneurs who have convinced a community around them and then that somehow leads to you so you are getting through your personal contacts a recommendation and you're also getting a pseudo recommendation from co-founders because if one co-founder is founding a company with someone else it means that they both thought that the opportunity was was strong enough so let me flip it over um, to what should entrepreneurs be looking for an investor. Uh, Rachel already talked about selling her vision and finding people who were interested in put incorporating social good into gaming. And I understand that Jonathan also has some investors, especially the most recent round. Um, I was looking up Jim Breyer's biography and he says he's very interested in social entrepreneurship and it seems like Kano is trying to bring a lot of education and fun to young children through technology. So um, Jonathan, do you want to talk about a f how to find a fit with an investor? Um, what should entrepreneurs be looking for? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I mean, it, you know, it's not, someone told me, you know, friendship, you know, for friendship you need shared values, for partnership the mathematics need to work. <coughs> um, and, and I think, and I think in, in, with investors, you know, both need to both need to work. You want someone who has shared values and a shared vision to what you're trying to build, um, and you also want them to be able to go, you know, the whole way with you. Uh, and you know, we want them to have deep pockets and be able to support you as the company grows, um, because it's a long, it's a long, long journey. Um, you know, we've been so far, we've been lucky with investors that totally get the vision, and you know, a common about social entrepreneurship. I think every entrepreneurship is social by default. If it's not, then it's probably illegal. Um, every <laughs> business that every business that gets, uh, you know, i.e. Silk Road was not entrepreneurship. It was, <laughs> right? Uh, but, you know, every entrepreneurial endeavor that gets people to wake up in the morning, you're trying to do good. Even if it's a, sell, even if it's a CRM software as a service, you're trying to help salespeople do a better job and succeed, and if they do that, their company does do better. They hire more people. The salespeople themselves have more equity in their life to support their family, get their kids' education. I mean, every business by default is a social entrepreneurship, and if it's not, it's probably illegal. So I think with that in mind, it's really important just to find, you know, the right incentives both kind of social and economical with investors, you want to be able to feel there's a click. I mean, you know, anyone with a with a long-term relationship would, would, would say that, you know, you don't know how it's going to look like. And, you know, I'm saying this as someone who started a company with two people that I've known very, very briefly before we started. And one of them I knew for 12 hours before we started a company. 
together. And you know, it's an evolving relationship, and it's the same with investors. You know, we now have over almost 15 individuals as investors throughout you know the journey. Uh, not to mention the 14,000 backers on Kickstarter. Um, so. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, especially at the early stages where you're not raising a hundred million dollar from the Goldman Sachs of the world, you know, you want to feel that there is a match. So spend time with investors and spend time with investors when you don't need to raise money. You know, I go back and just adding a point to the converse, to the to the question around when is the right timing. When the time comes that you need to raise money, you better be ready with investors who are already opening their checkbook. Because when you need to raise money and then you go and raise money, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to raise money. Because most investors, and Will can answer on his behalf, most investors do not want to invest in people who actually need money. You want to come and start a conversation with Will and coming with a prototype telling him, hey Will, you know, a friend of mine told me you know, you're a great investor and uh, you're a great investor. And, and look, I, I'm not raising at the moment. I'd love to get, I'd love to get, I'd love to get your feedback on where we are as a product, where we are as a company, and really just anything you can help. Just would love your feedback. And you want to end up the meeting with Will saying, "Hey, I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to give you money, right?" Instead of you saying, "That's how much we're raising, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Now I know it might sound like, "Oh, this is a fairy tale," but actually. And that's a lot of the process we've done, and you know we've we've been lucky, and I've been personally lucky to get a lot of guidance on that, and starting conversation with investors when you don't need money, um, and just build the network, build the relationships. It's all about relationships. No one likes to be feeling like he's a checkbook, especially not investors. Spend time broadening the network. It's a job, and it's a job that is is every day you build relationships, and it's not just with investors. It's in every single part of the business, in the way you build the team. You know, you're not going to hire the right people when you need right people. You need to build these relationships ahead of ahead yeah. of the curve. Uh, and one of your roles as a founder is to all the time be one step ahead and knowing who are the right people you need to know. And you know, it's a, it's a people, it's a it's a work around people, not around processes. Yeah, I, I would I would second a lot of what Jonathan just said, and I, I think that um, I think that what people you know, it's always very difficult to raise money, but if you can build that vision with that with that investor pre before you need that money then you, you kind of you literally have created this bond between them and this common shared vision and I can't emphasize that enough about meeting them beforehand and I think you know in a perfect world you know what you would look for is you would think about what are the biggest challenges you're going to face in the next you know 12 to 18 months and say you know who are those investors that can help me solve that so that might be a VC that could be an angel who's a specialist in a certain industry but trying to find those investors who are, who are really really suitable to helping you solve those challenges. And then the final thing I'd say, and this is something that you know, I, I can't emphasize this enough to entrepreneurs, because I used to say this uh, you know, when we started the fund, because I did it when I was finding my investors, but it's amazing now. We've made a, almost 20 investments, and so few entrepreneurs ever ask for this, but it's you know, when you're talking to investors, you should be doing due diligence on them as much as they do it on you. I mean, you should talk to, that, talk to the people they've invested in before. Talk to people who they've invested in that have companies have failed and the companies have succeeded and see how they act, see how they work, see, you know, are they calling all the time? Are they never calling or never answering their phone? Just try to understand how an investor works and, and then decide, does that work with the way that you like to work? Thanks so much for all these points. So we have just over 15 minutes left in the call. Thanks to everyone who's joining in and sticking with us. Um, I'd like to uh, talk, just recap a bit what, is, what we've been saying. We've had some great points on investor management, on managing your social net network, and um, uh, how to speak to investors. Um, we, there's also some great stuff on finding a fit, doing due dil diligence on the investors themselves, finding out whether they can offer something very interesting to your venture, whether it is their network or their expertise. We talk about <coughs> this a lot in week four, about the need to find smart money and take smart money. Um, since we only have 15 minutes left, I'd like to touch on some other uh, points that were raised. So. Perhaps we could talk briefly about uh, crowdfunding and then maybe go into some other practical aspects uh, of raising money. So, Jonathan, since you've, uh, you are the one on the panel here who has had experience with crowdfunding, can you talk about how it's been different raising money from the crowd and raising money from investors? And then could you comment on um, this experiment with um, uh, allowing communities to back, your, uh, to back Kano? 
and gain equity. So this is a new this is the this is the highlighting aspect. Yeah. So two, it's two separate use cases. Um, on the Kickstarter front, you know, I see it less as raising money from from the crowd. I see it more as bringing people from the community into the vision of what we're trying to create um, and making them feel like this is something that they would either one would love to see coming to life uh, or this is something that they would like to see coming to life plus they would love to use or give it to someone. And I think Kickstarter have been phenomenal in that providing that kind of platform um, you know, to, 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 to tap into an incredible network of several million people in one place. Um, and having said that, it's, it's, it requires a lot of things to work well in order to be really, really successful on Kickstarter. And, you know, not surprisingly, out of more than half a million projects, campaigns launched on Kickstarter in the past five years, still only about 100 have crossed the $1 million of funding. Um, and, you know, we're, 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 we're totally thrilled to be one of those 100. And, and the reason is, is because, you know, people are going to spend money and you need to convince them why this is interesting and why what you're doing is unique and why on earth would they give money to you whom, you, whom they never met before to do something you've never done before and hopefully deliver on their promise, especially with many Kickstarter campaigns kind of not being successfully fulfilled. Um, so that has been very, very challenging and, you know, I think it's a kind of, it's, a, it's almost like a separate session which obviously uh, I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to share more about that and, and, and if you feel like they want to reach they're going to reach out directly then easiest ways probably either WeChat or WhatsApp uh, and uh, on, on the other side um, on, on, on actually on something that is still going live from our side which is choir so we've, we've used choir online um, to do allocate half a million of our 15 million dollar series a round um, and we've allocated ha that half a million only to the people from our community and from our community it means people who have actually bought the Cano computer. So it's not open to the public. It's only open for people who are within the Cano community today. <coughs> and we've invited them, we've invited them to become, you know, small shareholders in the company. And and you know the result is kind of a partnership between us and Choir who are, let's say, they play the role of the Kickstarter here. They do all the plot they do the platform, they run and manage the campaign. Um, and we've basically kind of reached out directly to our community. And you know for us as a company this has really been part of the core principles of our company from the beginning of bringing people in to our vision, bringing, bringing people into our journey and not just investors. Um, and I think one of the things that kind of uh, is being manifested because of that mission that we take uh, is also the fact that we've incorporated our own nation during this period. We're losing you, Jonathan. Um, so we, we just lost the your, last sentence. So I was just saying uh, that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. So I, I was just saying that we've we've also, as part of that kind of social element of bringing the community in, uh, we're also uh, we've also incorporated recently our own foundation, which is called Cano Academy, and we've kind of benchmarked it on the model of Salesforce Foundation. So it's one 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 model. So we've allocated an undiluted one percent of the company shares to our foundation. So the foundation will always have 1% of the company shares, also 1% of employee time, and 1% of our units sold a year we are donating uh, to people around the world who, cannot, who either cannot afford themselves kind of, or trying to empower young entrepreneurs globally. So, you know, the Kickstarter and the choir, uh, it's all kind of part of a broader mission that we take of, you know, being a kind of a truly socially motivated company um, uh, and, and doing that from day one and not necessarily after we become publicly traded or something like that. So that's fascinating and it's interesting to see you use crowdfunding as a tool. Let me try and throw in some other questions. So um, Rachel or Will, you could um, maybe uh, pitch into this question from Lucas from LA. So Lucas says, apart from the fundamental questions surrounding the venture, such as uh, the break-even point, profitability, the burn rate, what other questions can we expect from a potential investor? So Rachel, do you want to talk about maybe some surprising or tough questions that you received or maybe even tough experiences that you had while while fundraising and mm -hmm. um, will you also you already answered um, some of these uh, maybe you could highlight the ones that you think are a bit unique such as the fact that you only invest in co-founded 
teams or co-founded ventures rather than single founder ventures. Well, do you want to start? I'm going to have to think about this for a second. Yeah, so I think on the specific things that an investor might ask, it, it really varies depending on what type of company you have. So, you know, if you're a consumer company, uh, you know, I might start asking, let's say a consumer e-commerce company, I might start asking about how you do your shipping, your logistics, where you store your stock. I might ask things like, um, uh, uh, what's your cost of customer acquisition? You know, what methods of marketing you're using? You know, that's kind of your consumer e-commerce company. Then if you're a, you know, a... Um, uh, uh, a B2B uh, enterprise databasing company, I might talk about how long it takes you to, to get a customer, to, to get to a meeting with a customer. I might talk about what's your sales uh, sales processes. I might talk about, you know, uh, the actual, uh, much more in depth on the technology because that would be much more important in a databasing startup than it would be necessarily in an e-commerce, uh, um, uh, uh, an online e-commerce site. So it's just more, it really, it's very hard to answer a question unless you know specifically what the startup is. Um, <coughs> That would be kind of my my view on it. You know, if if you're a mobile app, maybe it's about how much users and the growth in users or the activity of the users. Um, so it, it really depends on the company. So it's hard for me to answer specifically. That you know, actually is quite useful. So you're already giving some guidelines depending on what type of company someone is. And what I'm hearing yeah. as well is that um, Will, you are looking at B two B, B two C ventures, and in the software space. So yep. it's also worth checking out a VC's background, as you mentioned before, finding what types of things they like to invest in, and um, being prepared for those kinds of questions. Rachel, maybe I can um, clarify the re the previous question that I sent you with a uh, or complement it somehow. This is a, a question on soft skills required to convince yes. investors. Yeah, that's great. That's actually uh, just the direction I thought that I would take my answer before before you clarified that. Um, what I, I didn't understand initially, and I, and I think this is very practical advice even though it's sort of more um, abstract, uh, is that raising investment is very much about psychology. So there's kind of this underlying thing, and Will, please feel free to chime in uh, coming from the other side, but if an investor, it, it, it's supply and demand. So if um, when you're desperate for money and no one is in, it looks like the demand for what you're offering, essentially equity in your company, is lower. So an investor is going to be less likely to want to jump in on that. But whenever you're raising a round and you've you know, set a certain amount and you're close to closing that full amount, then there's only a small amount of allocation that you still have left. So an investor sees that there's a higher <laughs> demand and a limited supply. So they're more likely to pull the trigger more quickly. So once I came to understand that, I was able to kind of um, position our raise in such a way that I was letting investors know, like, hey, we only have this amount of allocation left at this specific valuation cap. We're going to close on X date. Usually, I would try to say um, I would try to set things up so that we were raising the cap, um, you know, within a two-week period. So there was a sense of urgency, and that way, I was able to get either a quicker yes or a quicker no. And um, another thing I didn't understand initially was that uh, a quick no is the second best answer. Sort of the worst thing that <laughs> can happen, um, in my opinion, when you're raising money is um, when an investor kind of, and this happens more when you're sort of a more naive entrepreneur, when you're less experienced, uh, when an investor kind of drags their feet and doesn't give you a yes or a no, and you're still kind of holding out hope that they're going to come in, the slow no. I, right. It's it's the worst. You what you want to do is you want to you want to know yes or no as quickly as possible so that way if someone says no, you can start refocusing your energy on other investors who may be more likely to give you that quick yes. So um and, and the other thing about that though is that the slow no is it's an answer in and of itself. If if someone is dragging their feet, um it's important to um to realize that they're probably no is probably the answer. They just for whatever reason haven't sort of like blatantly told you that. So um. Just That's kind of really helpful, Rachel. Yeah, uh, just those those mechanics are um, are important to understand. It really is all psychology, I think, um, on right. a certain level. So those soft skills are really important when uh, it comes to raising money. And I like how you created or underlined the sense of urgency, saying that within two weeks I need to um, raise this money. And um, perhaps something else that's interesting is maybe using the amount of equity that um, is available also as <clears throat> as a way to to say this is a very rare uh, and unique opportunity. So I have to ask this question, um, which has been raised by many students. So what is the maximum percentage of your share that you should let uh, an investor um, uh, acquire? I, I think um, you should let the investors have everything. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, for, 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 from my perspective, I think that you know you, um, there are lots of different types of investors. 
and different investors can add very different things. I think, uh, you know, before you decide to raise money, the founders should have an idea of what they're willing to give away. So this is on one side. The founders should be willing to understand what they're willing to give away and what they're not. And so that way they can rule out any options or offers that are not within that range. I think in reality, what often happens is that a lot of investors are looking for roughly between 15 to 25% of the company in any round. And so I think as a founder, in the tech world at least anyway, that's really where you should be willing to give up. I know in other industries like in food, um, uh, I know you, you usually have to give away a lot more because it, it's, it's a different type of company with a different potential exit. But in the tech world, you should, you should be willing to give away between 15 and 25%. And I don't know whether you guys have experienced different things, but... That's my view of it. Well, what's also interesting is in our conversation when I asked Jonathan about his future plans for fundraising, he mentioned that he also wanted to, uh, by the next time, uh, in, in the sh short to medium term, transform Kano into a profitable company where, which wouldn't need external financing. So um, that's also, I guess, an answer in itself that you should limit the amount of equity that you're giving up. Jonathan, do you also want to pitch in? Okay. Yeah, um, I, I, I think it's a good I think it's a good question to you know for people to actually uh, to ask. I agree, um, and and I, I'm I'm ten, I tend to I tend to echo um, Will's Will's comment, but I would add that at the end at the end of the day, what's most important uh, when you raise the money is not if you're on 15, if you give 15 or 25. Um, for the right investor, make the go the extra mile to make them happy. Um, uh, the right investor would also want you to be happy. Um, so you need to remember that. And if you don't feel the right investors, you know, may, try and make you happy as well as in being happy, then fit. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you want to have the right investors. And in some cases, not in all cases, in some cases, the right investors would want more because. They, you know, they, 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 they are very clear with what's their added value and how they can support your growth. You know, especially kind of the top tier investors. Um, and it's, it's a, you know, it's the game that it's, it's part of part of the raising. It's, it's a game, and the game of the valuation and the game of the percentage. It's, it's a game. And as long as the company is an early stage, which basically means the first several years of the company's life, you know, you need to be able to play that game and remember that. You know the equity is very very important, uh, but you 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 need at the end of the day you want to be with ten percent of a company worth a billion dollar rather than uh, you know thirty percent of a company valued at at, at ten million dollars. Um, you know so right. the mathematics are clear. Could so I, that's I, a really good one extra thing. Sorry, just quite a quick thing. I think just on on, on top of Jonathan, what you're saying there because you're talking about negotiating and and and, and kind of debating these kind of things. One of the biggest mistakes I see entrepreneurs make when you get to kind of the term sheet stage, when you're debating back and forth, what is the valuation, what the, should the terms be, is that people focus on positions rather than interests. So they focus on this idea that, you know, I want a valuation of X or, or I won't accept vesting or term Y or term Z, instead of thinking, actually, what am I trying to do here? What is the investor trying to do? Why, why do they want this term? Why do I not want this term? Mm -hmm. and actually having an open discussion about it. People get very focused on the position and not the interest. And at the end of the day, if someone's talking to you about a, a term sheet, it means that both of you want to invest. One of you wants the investment and one of you wants to invest. And it's just about getting there and trying to understand why are the why is one person using these terms and another person not wanting them. I think uh, if you get out the idea of position uh, positions and focus on what are the interests and why do people care about certain points? It moves through negotiations much faster and allows you to get your investment from the investor you want faster as well. Right, so those are really great points. We're running out of time here, so I just want to sum up. I think what Jonathan was saying was really interesting. Um, I could even break, take it to a, a larger extreme. Um, owning 100% of a company that's worth nothing is, is still owning nothing, right? And so if you want to... Um, get your your venture off the ground and then if you want to eventually later expand it or, and scale your company you're they're going to have to be some negotiations you're going to have to give up some equity and what's important in those cases is to find someone that has a strong vision match and um, and then Will's point was to once you get to the point once you get to the negotiating table once the term sheet is presented that means that both parties want to um, work together uh, 
work together. Exactly. Thanks, Will. And so, um, and so the point is to try and make that go as smoothly as possible. Um, so. I, in closing, I'd like to ask one last question to all the panelists. This is from Alfred, who's in Accra, Ghana. And um, his question is, did people tell you that your venture was too risky and that you should think of something less risky? So um, Jonathan, maybe you can start. Uh, you know. You, if someone told you your startup idea is too risky or, or too crazy, like it, you're probably onto something. Hmm. If, if people don't think you're, I mean, you're otherwise, what are you gonna start? What? Are, yeah, I mean, you wanna be in a place where people tell you, like, look, for, from, I'll give our us as an example. When we started the company, the main sentences we received from from people in general was like. Why are you starting a new type of computer company? There's like, you know, the world is full of computers, and we're like, yeah, but it's not the right computer for the generation we're trying to in, to empower, right? So, you know, people with with an idea that that people might think either is crazy, either is irrelevant, or too risky, you know, at the end of the day, you need to prove to yourself and to the rest of the world that you have something that you believe can happen, and if you're passionate about it, try and do it because at the end of the day, you know. What makes you? What makes me wake up in the morning is passion to make something that a lot of people would want, uh, and it maybe start with with a niche audience, but it can grow to a global uh, force uh, of people who demand what you're building. Um, and you want to wake up in the morning for something like that, rather than. And I'm not diminishing other startup ideas, but you know, I think you're either the type of person who can take, who can go into an existing market and try and change it. Or you're the type of, of entrepreneur who want to create something completely new, which is probably also very risky, um, you know. But with great risk, with great risk come great rewards. And if you succeed, then fine. If not, then you failed and try again. That's wonderful, Jonathan. So you're saying go for these risky ideas. Will do you want to comment? Because another term for venture capital is risk capital, and I understand venture capitalists they want to take uh, a large um, uh, stake in 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 an idea because maybe. To, because if then it works out, then they will also get a payout. Well, I think you know. I think venture capital is a very risky model. I think if start historically, if you look at portfolios of venture capitalists in the U.S. and Europe, you know you have roughly of every ten companies they invest in, it will six will lose all of the money that they invest in. You know, if you look at other areas of investing, whether it's you know private equity, hedge funds, pension funds, mutual funds, you know, realistically, that level of risk is nowhere comparable to them. And so, you know, the, the people who invest in us, who are you know banks, family offices, pension funds, they only allocate a very small amount of their money to a venture capital fund because what we do is so risky. But but uh, but as as Jonathan right, point, rightly pointed out, you know, without taking that risk, you know, you don't have those rewards. And you know, venture capital, with a very small amount of capital, can return quite a lot to our investors as well. Um, and I would very much second what Jonathan pointed out about, you know, it, it's I mean, it's crazy. If people if people don't think you're a little bit crazy about what you're doing, uh, you know, it's probably too obvious <laughs> an idea, and there's probably already a hundred other people doing it. Right. So entrepreneurs should um, go for these risky ideas and also seek money from people who are also interested in taking these risks. So, um, for example, in debt financing, uh, Jonathan, you mentioned that with Barclays you have some help um, with your uh, from them to deal with your inventory, but you're not going to, to be able to get a large amount of money from a bank at the same rate as you can get from a venture capitalist. Rachel, do you want to add some closing words on um, maybe something that someone told you about your venture that it was too risky <laughs> or something else? Sure. Um, I mean, as you guys were talking, uh, in our case, we're kind of sort of leveraging two problems against one another that seem very disparate. Um, one problem is lack of capital access for uh, micro entrepreneurs in the developing world, uh, particularly for women. And the other problem is totally separate. It's that freemium mobile games are really inefficiently monetized and only 6% of users ever spend any money in a game. So we can help the game monetize more effectively. So I think it seemed crazy to people that we were trying to kind of combine those two things. And in the beginning, whenever I was kind of figuring out what my pit pitch needed to be, I was often asked, like, well, why don't you just be a microfinance company? Or why don't you focus on one side or the other? Why are you trying to be two businesses? And I would try and respond and say, like, no, we're not two businesses. We're, we're kind of leveraging these two things against one another to create this single elegant solution that solves both, both problems in what's actually a, a pretty simple way. 
Um, and as you guys were talking, I, I thought of something I read recently on Quora. It was somebody talking about meeting you know, the, the co-founders of Google in the late 90s and, and thinking like, oh great, it's another search engine or something. And like, um, and then like even sort of like the, my understanding of the development of the internet um, in the early 90s, like people were just using computers for word processing. So it seemed like nuts. Like why would you want to connect computers to one another through like an information superhighway? Like, did you want to do that because that way I could do word processing on your device, like, remotely? Like, why would you do that? So, I mean, so the point, I guess, is that ideas that can turn out to be really great and that are really kind of showing a lot of foresight can often seem super, not only crazy or risky at the beginning, but they might also just look like bad ideas. They might not make sense. Um, so... If you, the point is like know your know your users yourself, um, and if you see that there's a clear demand for what you're you're providing, don't listen to those people that don't understand your market in the same way and don't understand the users. Um, you you can see for yourself. That's amazing. So it seems like the job of the entrepreneur is to really understand the vision and the vent, the purpose of their venture and sell that vision and and do it well. It's the job of the entrepreneur to convince investors that this is a um, an up-and-coming vision that's worth investing in. So I would like to thank now all of our panelists and thanks to all the viewers who are watching. The panelists have been really open in um, being available for further advice and feedback. I'm going to invite the panelists to our Facebook group for our course and you can also contact them on Twitter. Um, Jonathan mentioned that the best way to get in touch with him is WhatsApp and WeChat so I'm going to take a note of that right now. Um, <laughs> so thanks again to all our panelists, Rachel, Will, and Jonathan for spending an hour with, um, with our students. This video will be uploaded online to Coursera and translated so that our French viewers can also take a look. Great. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you. Have a great afternoon okay. and good evening to bye, some. Bye. 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 bye.